Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Have you ever found yourself just walking all over your house trying to find something? You're like, where is it? Like, where? I, the keys have to be somewhere around here. And you keep looking and looking and looking. You're looking in every drawer in the house. You're looking under the couch. You're looking in the couch cushions. You're like, where? And you just start getting really frustrated, right? You get more and more irritated by the second. Oh, come on. I can't be the only one, right? Like, where is it? And you're looking, you're looking. I've got to be somewhere at 10 a.m. I got to be somewhere at 11 a.m. Where? I can't find it. And the more you look, Just, I don't know about you, just like I get more irritated and more frustrated and more bothered and more irritated. And then you you start picking up things and you find yourself, you're putting them down harder and harder because you're getting irritated. You're getting angry, right? Oh, come on. Come on. Don't act so spiritual. At least I do. When I'm looking for something and I can't seem to find it, I find myself getting more and more irritated by the second. And that is where we are today. I'm very frustrated. I'm very irritated because when we started this series, we were simply going to look. We were simply going to do a small search to find the enemies within the church. And now here we are in part four, and we have not found one. (laughs) We can't seem to find the enemies within the church because we've been reviewing audio of a Understanding the Times podcast episode where they are supposedly identifying the enemies within the church, and it seems to me all they are doing is looking at political issues outside of the church that they feel is now destroying the church. It's it's really bizarre. You can go back and listen to part one, part two, and part three. It's been extremely frustrating up to this point. But with all of that, let me welcome you. It is Saturday, September the 10th, 2022. It is currently 1049 a.m. Central Time. And let me tell you, just for full transparency, I don't necessarily want to be sitting here in front of this microphone at 1049 a.m. on Saturday, September the 10th, because college football games are about to begin in 10 minutes, okay? So I'd rather be there, but but sometimes, sometimes I like when I have, I, I now, you, you may think this is a ridiculous idea, and this has nothing to do with our topic, so I know I'm violating. People are going to be like, I hate when podcasters do that, but that's okay. That's okay, because maybe this becomes a podcast episode in, uh, uh, in and of itself. You can see. But sometimes I like when I'm in a situation where I want to do a certain thing. I want to do that, right? Everything in me says, that's what I want to do. There's not anything inherently wrong with sitting down at 11 a.m., having some food and watching some college football. There's nothing wrong with that in any way, shape, or form, right? There, there's nothing greatly spiritual about it, but it, it, it's more just a fleshly activity. Fleshly in the sense of not spiritual, not necessarily sinful. But sometimes when I realize that, I like to deny myself of it just for trying to continue to practice the idea of denying self, dying self. So I I decided instead of doing that, I would be here and talk to you, but I'm talking to you about a subject that has bothered me greatly. But but I digress. I digress. It is Saturday, September the 10th, 2022. It is currently 1051 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio. Remember, we had this whole discussion, studio, studios, studio, located right here in Abilene, Texas, where I have been spending a lot of hours looking, searching for, lifting up things, looking in every drawer, looking under every couch and bed in the house. Where are the enemies within the church? But I can't seem to find them, especially listening to, well, a podcast episode that's supposed to be identifying the enemies within the church. It seems like to me, all they are doing is standing at their window, pointing at those outside of the church. However, when they have mentioned people in the church, <laughs> basically it's gone like this. Albert Moeller is of the devil. Now, a little bit of hyperbole, but this is not far. Albert Moeller is of the devil because he believes people that he believes in the reality of sexual orientation. All right. And so that's a denial of biblical teaching. He's a heretic. I, so. Yeah, sermon audio. You may want to realize that. Yeah, I guess supposedly you have a heretic on your on your uh, 
uh, on your platform. Okay, yeah, that that's that one was bizarre. Okay, and then Russell Moore. Now I understand a lot of people don't like Russell Moore, but Russell Moore seems to be of the enemy because he believes and supported the rights of Muslims. Oh no to build mosque in the United States of America. I know how egregious, how evil for someone to support someone's religious freedoms. <laughs> Christians are the first ones. That, religious freedom is under attack. They won't say Merry Christmas. <laughs> religious freedom is under attack because they make Disney movies that offend us, right? Okay, Christians, and I know a little bit of hyperbole, but, I, but this is just so ridiculous. So Russell Moore is basically of the devil, because he believes that Muslims have the right to build mosques in the United States of America, which I 100% support their right to do so. The one thing I love about America is the freedom of religion. I want the Muslim to build the mosque. I want the Satanists to build the first church of Satan. I want them to build church, their churches, their temples, their places of worship, synagogue, mosque, whatever it is. And I just want the right as a Christian to be able to talk about Christ, preach Christ, that's the that's a pluralistic freedom of religion kind of society. But some Christians are like, it was well, this it's almost like they want a theocracy. And that's great. You stop mosque from building mosque. You stop Muslims from building mosque. Just wait until, I don't know, Catholics take over and then Protestants won't be able to build their churches. And then when Protestants are in charge, then Catholics won't be able to build their Yeah, well, let's go back. Let's see how that played out in church history. Because whenever we get some kind of theocratic religious nationalism going, people always start dying in the name of God. So I'm baffled by supposedly the enemies within the church. Albert Moeller for believing in sexual, identi- sexual orientation and Russell Moore for, I guess, supporting the building of Musk. It's been insane. Now, remember, I still want you to send me your list of three enemies within the church, three enemies you have identified. Now, when this is all over, I'm going to identify what I think are three enemies within the church. But so far, this is crazy. We we have about 27 minutes left of this to review. Again, we are reviewing uh, an episode from Understanding the Times podcast. I would tell you to subscribe to it, Typically, I find, you know, I may not always agree with everything, but I find something interesting. This one is baffling because when I when I saw what they were going to talk about enemies within the church. Oh, I thought it was going to be a great podcast episode, but I'm just so frustrated because they spent more time talking about. I mean, so far, if you think the greatest enemy within the church, according to them, is socialism and Marxism. And I, I, I am baffled that they would think that that's the greatest enemy within the church is socialism and Marxism. It's just baffling to me. But we're going to let, let, let them finish. I would, again, tell you to, to go subscribe to Understanding the Times podcast. This is an episode from like two weeks ago, and uh, we've been working on it throughout the week. And uh, well, we're going to try to finish it this morning. So here we go. Now, w- when we jump back in, remember... There's no easy way to just a smooth transition. It's like walking to the edge of the pool and jumping in. We're going to, they're, they're about to continue to go against Russell Moore and the idea of Muslims being allowed to build a mosque in the United States of America. Because if, if, if one group of Muslims do something wrong, then all of Islam should be condemned. Just like if one Christian does something wrong, all Christians should be, no, we don't, we don't play that game. I understand there's major issues with with Islam. I, I'm not in any way saying it's an, a, a great religion. I believe it's a false religion. But just because someone is a part of a religion that may be problematic doesn't mean they themselves are problematic. And bottom line, in the United States of America, there's freedom of religion. Now, that freedom ends when you begin to use your religion to promote violence or to carry out violence against people. Yeah, now there's a problem. I don't care if that's a, a so-called Christian church or a Muslim mosque. It doesn't matter. So, um, But I want people to have as much freedom as humanly possible, and so should you. Freedom of religion doesn't mean everyone is right. Right. means everyone has the freedom to practice their religion. And I, and I want everyone to have the freedom to practice it, and I want the freedom to reject it and speak against it. All right, here we go. Again, another clip from the film We Carry, Enemies Within the Church. Find it in my online store, olivetreeviews.org. 
You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line from Sioux City, Iowa, Pastor Kerry Gordon, Cornerstone World Outreach. Pastor Kerry Gordon, okay, Russell Moore has thankfully stepped down from Southern Baptist Seminary. But talk to me about this clip we played. It's from your film. Russell Moore actively participated in aiding and helping to build mosques in the United States after 9-11. And I think... Oh, no. Oh, no. He actively supported them building mosques. It was he simply supporting religious freedom after 9-11. I understand 9-11 was horrible. 9-11 was absolutely tragic and devastating and an evil act. It should be condemned. And those who carried it out, those who planned and plotted, it should be condemned. All right? Well, I mean, we, we could have a lot of discussions about that, right? We could talk about, well, wait, we went after Afghanistan, but wouldn't the hijackers from Saudi Arabia? Well, we could have a long discussion about lots of things there. But I guess in their mind is, hey, after 9-11, Muslims should no longer be able to build a mosque anywhere. I, that, I'm sorry. That's, that's, I don't know what you're trying to establish other than maybe it sounds like a religion, a Christian theocracy, some kind of Christian nationalism. I think we can all see strategically that that is a pole position, that is a dominion flag Mm -hmm. for Islam, that right after they kill thousands of innocent people on 9-11 in New York, they fought and won to build a mosque. They, they, the people who were trying to build a mosque, were they the ones who carried out the 9-11 terrorist attack? Were they involved in the terrorist attack? Did they support the terrorist attack? Or are you saying they simply because they're Muslim? So if one if one person of a certain race carries out a crime, should then all people of that race no longer be? Let's say uh, one person of a certain race uses a gun and has a mass shooting. Should everyone of that race now be banned from carrying guns because that race is dangerous? He said, well, Islam has some inherent problems. I, I am the first to admit it. But it's still a religion that has the freedom to exercise and practice that religion in the United States of America. And we would want to support that religious freedom as much as possible, because when you deny freedom to one, you deny freedom to you. As close as possible to the site where those buildings were collapsed. And this is the way Islam works, is their sign of conquest. They, by building the mosque, send a signal to other would-be terrorists around the world. We are winning. We are taking over. And of course, it's not branded that way. They say, no, we just believe in the First Amendment. We just want to have freedom of religion. And I'm all for the freedom of religion for everyone, even wrong religions. And I'll say that very openly and clearly because I believe that Christianity is the only true religion and that the truth always wins. And Christianity doesn't need to be worried about competition because it will defeat its competition because its competition is based on lies. However, Islam... Christianity will defeat its competition? Now, let me make sure. Now, what do you mean Christianity will defeat its competition? You mean Christ will defeat his rivals? No, because just trying to understand this from an, it depends on your eschatology. Now, I guess if you go with a post-millennial view, then then the Christianity, I guess, will defeat all of its enemies and everything will be placed under subjection. But my eschatology was saying, no, 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 way it's going to work. Christianity is Christianity from its external perspective. The church is going to become more and more apostate. The church is going to fall apart. Christianity is going to become, in a sense, weaker and weaker. It's no longer going to have a cultural influence. More and more people are going to abandon it. And it'll be few that are holding on to when the majority turns against it. Then Christ will come back, or the, depending on how you want to work out your eschatology, the church will be raptured out, whatever is, you know, the true Christians will be raptured out. And then ultimately you've got the tribulation and then Christ will return and destroy all of his enemies and then place everything under subjection during the millennial kingdom. Then Satan is loose and destroyed, depending on how you look at your eschatology. So we, well, Christianity will defeat its enemies. Are, are you sure? Christianity is not always quote unquote victorious over its enemies. Christianity, it, th- th- there's few who find the way there's few who are saved. 
So I, I, I don't know what he means by that, but okay, okay. I mean, we'd have to get into some serious eschatology, which is just funny because this is a podcast, Understanding the Times, which is supposed to be all about biblical prophecy, but they're making comments with no concern with how that fits into their biblical eschatology because they're more concerned with political issues than they are actual biblical issues. But here we go. Islam is a special case because they kill people. And the only way that you should ever allow an Islamic mosque to be built in the United States is if they will publicly disavow the fifth pillar of Islam, which is jihad. That is not being done. So what you have is a leading voice. Of so the only way a mosque should be built in the United States is they would have to denounce a certain thing about Islam, about jihad. You're going to make rules. You're going to make rules. And please note, Christianity has a history of people dying at its hands. Whether it's witch trials, whether it's one group killing off another group, whether it's persecution, you name it. Catholics killing Protestants, Protestants killing Catholics, people panicking, thinking a witch, witchcraft has gone rampant and people being burned and killed, whether the European witch trials, we had some here in the United States of America, obviously Salem, uh, Massachusetts is, is, is probably the one that has the most fame. And some of those, some of what happened at Salem is not c correctly represented. I've, I've been to Salem, been to the witch uh, museum. I love, I love that place. I love everything about just, it's just, Something intrigues me about that entire situation. It just shows how paranoia and panic leads to, well, really bad things happening. So I just, I just want to make, whenever we talk about Muslims killing people, Christians got a, uh, some blood on their hands as well. I mean, you know, Christians supporting slavery, Christians supporting segregation, uh, Christians resisting the Jim Crow, uh, are, are supporting the Jim Crow laws, all, all the different things that has happened within Christianity. I mean, Christianity is not innocent either. Southern Baptist Church helping people who will not renounce the fifth pillar of Islam build mosques to plant a flag of dominion in the United States. And it's treacherous and it's evil. And frankly, if I were Satan, that's how I would do it. I think, Pastor Gordon, the thing that troubles me, and I want to make just a little diversion here. Russell Moore had connections to George Soros, which is something I don't quite understand. I cannot imagine how Money is such an enticer that evangelicals or supposed evangelicals yoke with the likes of George Soros, another hardcore communist, other than end time strong delusion. But just a little aside here, and I'm not sure if you even have any thought on it. I have followed the National Association of Evangelicals since the 1980s. They were such a sound outfit. They were founded before my time. I believe they were founded in 1942. Because they were founded to come up against the National Council of Churches, which was totally leftist, even way back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And yet, by the 90s, they were going so far left under Richard Sizek, it was just shocking. Then in 2011, they came out, I'm reading from their website, a 2011 position paper on nuclear weapons. I believe at this point, they're under the direction of Pastor Leith Anderson. The National Association of Evangelicals, we unite in deploring the mindset that assumes the way to solve problems, meaning nuclear problems, is might and power. Then they say we should never forget that we are to love our enemies, Matthew 5, and overcome evil with good. All that's fine, but the Bible says to love our enemies, but North Korea and China and Iran aren't going to think twice about obliterating America with nuclear weapons. And yet, this is just bizarre. So someone has a position that doesn't like nuclear weapons and seems to oppose war, more of a pacifistic approach, quoting scripture, Jesus, his own words, love your enemy, turn the other cheek, resist not evil. There are enemies within the church. <laughs> the enemies within the church now, so the enemies within the church are those who believe in sexual orientation those who believe Muslims have a right to build a mosque and those who may oppose nuclear weapons and the use of nuclear weapons used in warfare because they believe scripture calls Christians to adopt a mindset of loving your enemy, turning the other cheek and resisting not evil. Now, I know most Christians look at those passages and like, that's not what Jesus meant. And they lower the standard 
to a standard in which we can meet, which I think destroys the entire purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is really an exposition of God's law. And the Sermon on the Mount, you don't want to lower the standards because those standards are there to demonstrate your inability to even keep the Sermon on the Mount, which drives you to the one who did not only preach the Sermon on the Mount, kept the Sermon on the Mount, and in him, then his obedience to the Sermon on the Mount uh, Mount becomes your obedience by his imputed righteousness. So everyone, everyone preaches the Sermon on the Mount in such bizarre ways, right? Like it's either like, oh, this proves that if you keep the Sermon on the Mount, you prove that you're genuinely saved. That is the most ridiculous thing. So you're telling me I prove that I'm saved by keeping the law of God? Well, then I'm never going to prove that I'm saved because I never keep the law of God. Just start with some basic things in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Pure in heart. Uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, be ye perfect as your heavenly father is, uh, is perfect. Well, we've never been perfect. The Sermon on the Mount is law that should condemn you and drive you to the gospel. We either make it somehow proving that I'm saved, which I don't know how law is going to prove you're saved because you're never going to keep the law. And then you're looking to your righteousness to prove you're saved versus an imputed righteousness. There's a million theological issues there, but it's just when people get to certain parts of the Sermon on the Mount, that's not what Jesus couldn't have meant that. He couldn't have meant that. Why? Because you want to lower the standard? That's like me going to the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. He didn't really mean that. He did Obviously, he didn't mean that. Thou shalt not covet. He didn't really mean that. Thou shalt not kill. He didn't. Why don't, why don't we just lower all the standards? He didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean that. Well, then sooner or later, we can all meet the standards and we don't even need Christ. So, uh, but I don't know how you're an enemy within the church because you're like, hey, nuclear war? Mm, I'm not so sure that's a Christian mentality. Nuclear war? I don't know if that's a biblical position. Nuclear war? I don't know because I'm supposed to love my enemy. Now, you should at least deal with that tension. How do I understand the pacifistic words of Jesus? Resist not evil. Resist not evil. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemy. How do you love your enemy when you're killing them? When Jesus, when, when Peter tried to defend Jesus, put away the sword. Now people say, well, that was only in that situation. We're supposed to have the sword and we're supposed to, atta- uh, you know, kill someone who tries to attack us. All I'm saying is there's a lot of issues with a lot of these positions that I think godly Christians have to struggle with and realize there is tension. They've just declared basically, hey, if you think that way, you're an enemy. You're an enemy within the church. I mean, that. Let's continue. The NAE came up with a totally Democrat Party suggestion that we banish America's nuclear weapons. So here again, we've left Southern Baptist Convention and gone to the National Association of Evangelicals. Wow. There's Christians out there who call for the banishment of nuclear weapons. What a crazy, unbiblical position. I mean, that is paramount to utter blasphemy. Really? That's that's the best you can come. The enemies within their church are anyone who wants nuclear weapons banished. Christianity has no room for you. If you come into Christianity and you believe in the banishment of nuclear weapons, you're an enemy. You need to be thrown out. And then please note... Democrat. It's all the, the all the verbiage is so political, 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 political. But it's a, all of it is political attack on those who may look at things from a left position because that can't be crazy. They're not even looking over to the, those who've been so politically hijacked from the right. But uh, you know, I I I've been saying this now for at least it sounds like my entire Christian life. It's the same thing. So I would be considered an enemy of the church. I, I've, ta- I've told the story a million times. I'm a Christian teenager. I, I've just be, I'm a brand new Christian. Haven't been saved that long. And I come to church. I think it was a Wednesday night. And I guess Reagan had uh, launched airstrikes. I don't remember on whom. Um, I, think, I was thinking Beirut. I, I can't remember exactly where the, the, the airstrikes. And I don't know if, how many people died. I don't remember all the details. But I remember walking in. The pastor stands up and says, Ronald Reagan launched airstrikes this afternoon, this evening, um, over this area. And, and, and the airstrikes were successful. And I remember everyone in the congregation standing up and applauding. And I looked around like, wait a minute, we're applauding possible people dying and being sent into eternity? I got up and walked out. I'm like, that's that, that how is this Christian? How is how, how is this godly? I came to church to learn about Christ, not to celebrate people dying in an airstrike. 
like it, it I, I, it, it's just, and, but that I'd be an enemy of the church. I'd be an enemy within the church because I'm thinking that's not a biblical position. I, it, it seems to be, put it this way, at least I would have to acknowledge there's tension here. Now, I, I would go back if, if you're like, so what's your position? I tend to go to the Augustinian just war view that maybe sometimes war is just, but it has to meet certain criteria. Uh, that's the best I can come up with. There's t- great tension here. And exactly what, how are we to think in regards to some of these situations? Kerry Gordon, and the drama is just as bad. Yes, and it's usually built on a fallacious either-or dichotomy. I mean, think about this. Jesus said, turn the other cheek, love your enemies. So when a man breaks into your house and announces with the gunpoint, I'm going to rape your wife and kill your children, then are you really supposed to offer to make him a ham yeah. sandwich? Yeah. And so when the Bible tells us to love our enemies... It- All right. Uh, this, is a, this is a go-to. This is a pretty go-to idea. Uh, so, 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 and I, I've heard Christians try to try to take this apart, right? They, become, they try to they really parse their words carefully here. So, so let's go through, because now I don't know what this has to do with enemies within the church, but hey, this is the direction they're going. Remember, I told you I'm frustrated because I keep looking for the enemies within the church and they just come up with these ridiculous t- topics. But this is a topic that has to be discussed and it makes everyone very angry at me and I don't understand why. So let's make sure we deal with a Bible, right? That gives us certain facts that as Christians we should be able to agree with, right? That all human beings are created in the image of God. Therefore, there is sanctity to human life. They are image bearers of God. That image is marred and messed up by sin, but they are created in the image of God. And that being image bearers of God is so instrumental in understanding humanity that the Bible seems to indicate, and I think you can prove this in Genesis and all the way up to possibly Romans, that if someone was to kill another human being, that they're basically killing, trying to extinguish the image of God. They are destroying someone creating the image of God. They are violating the sanctity of that life. And as a result of doing that, that's such a heinous crime that they then forfeit their life, which would support the idea of capital punishment. So, the, 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 so every human being is created in the image of God. There's some sanctity to their life. We also seem to know that human beings have an eternal soul that lives on after the body is dead. The body dies to be, when you die, to be basically separate from the body is to be present with the Lord. So then when someone dies, they enter into eternity and we know they either go to heaven or hell. So here's a, so just think about, here's a human being. They're created in the image of God. There's sanctity to their life right? They have an eternal soul. So if they die, they immediately go into eternity, right? Now, here I am. I'm a believer. Now, as a believer, as a believer, I believe, I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, right? So I'm going to go to heaven. Someone breaks into my house. High probability, they're not saved. High probability, they don't, are, are not believers in Christ, now, let's first take the scenario because this is these the, these scenarios are always given a certain way, but let's look at the scenario this way. They come in with a gun. Here I am. Let's say I I have a gun, right? I don't, but let's say I do. I grab a gun. Now, here's two individuals facing each other. Both are created in the image of God. Both lives have a sense of sanctity. Both both lives are obviously to be tr- treated with that sanctity and, and and value. Now, here's the thing. I'm supposed to love my enemy, turn the other cheek. So now what do I do here? The worst he can do to me is kill me and send me to heaven. That's the worst he can do to, for me. Or do I shoot and kill him and send him to hell? How, 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 what, what's the biblical, at that very moment, what's the biblical concept here? What, what is the biblical concept? Now, where's it? Well, he broke into your house. You're not, that's not, it's, you, can, you can love your enemy and, and, and put two bullets at him. That's acceptable. And I'm just saying, biblically, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't know. Jesus seems to say, love the enemy, turn the other cheek, resist not evil. I'm like, no, he didn't really mean that. Well, if he didn't really mean that, then you're lowering the standard to something you can do. Because I know in my flesh, guess what? I, I don't want I don't want to sit there and go, well, guess what? I'm going to place you before me. I'm going to love you. And because I don't know if you're going to go to heaven or hell, I will give up my life 
because I'm not going to send you to hell. Just, but if I say that, people say, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. That's stupid. That's, that's moronic. Well, wait a minute. Christ laid down his life. You say, yeah, but he, he was supposed. So then we make excuses. Well, Jesus had to do it because that was God's will. Okay, okay. But, but let's, let's take it a step further. Christians claim all the time that, that Christ is my rock, my protector, my shield. He will protect me. Nothing can come into my life that he doesn't allow. And that, that, my, that I cannot be harmed or killed unless it's the will of God. So on one hand, we talk about how he's my protector. He's my rock. He's my shield. Nothing can touch us. We are in the hands of God. Nothing can get to us without his permission. And then we own five guns to protect ourselves so sometimes there's a, there's a tension and there's a contradiction in the Christian world that we're not ever willing to deal with. Now, he changed it up a little bit. So so there's the scenario, me facing another person. We both have a gun. I'm the Christian. I don't know about the other person. Now, wh- how, what does it look like to love my enemy, turn the other cheek and resist not evil? Do I put three bullets in him and go, well, if, if, at least, at least I, I protected myself from going to heaven. And I sent them into eternity. Now, that's probably what I would do. I'm not denying that that's what I would do. I am, I am acknowledging, I don't know if that's the biblical right way to approach it. I'm acknowledging that if I own a gun, I'm, I'm, I'm boom, 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 boom. I'm unloading the gun, probably reload and put more just to make sure. That's what I'm going to do in my flesh. I am nowhere pretending to be spiritual. I just don't know if I can justify that biblically. And whenever you mention that tension, people get mad and they'll, they'll start trying to quote this and quote this and quote this. And it's like, look, you've got to deal with the words of Jesus. And if you want to take the Sermon on the Mount and reduce it in that area, well, Jesus didn't really mean that. He didn't really mean that. Well, then I'm going to go to everything in the Sermon on the Mount and reduce it and go, he didn't really mean, be ye perfect as your heavenly father. He didn't really mean be perfect. Be p- pure in heart. He didn't really mean be pure in heart. If you look at a woman with lust, he didn't really mean that. Like I can minimize every, if you're going to minimize it in one area, then we can minimize it in every every area and who gets to determine how far you minimize it this becomes a hermeneutical issue this becomes an honesty issue so but all right but let's go to the second uh, a kind of illustration that he used now this person breaks in the house he's got a gun and now he's threatening to rape your wife or rape your children or kill your children and kill your wife all right now, in this hypothetical thing, he's already got the jump on me, but I can grab the gun. Now, this would be an argument, not of self-preservation, of self-protection. This would be an issue. Now, how does this work out? Because now I do have a responsibility to protect family. So now am I justified in doing so? Would this now meet the, the just war requirement? Right? In a sense, now I'm, I'm going to engage in violence in order to protect others. Maybe it would fit the just war argument. I've often thought that from at least living here in the United States of America, that maybe one of the ways to deal with this tension is Jesus does tell me to love my enemy, turn the other cheek. How that all fits in here, I'm not sure. Now, there's nothing about it that I have to make them a ham sandwich. Like, that's just re, that's just going, that's just using a logical fallacy of just giving an absurd thing. You're creating an absurd straw man that you can easily knock down. I'm not, I don't, I'm not, not, I don't have any patience with those kinds of logical fallacies and games. We need to have an honest conversation here. This is the way I've looked at it. So, could I use the just war doctrine? to support the fact that I'm going to engage in violence in order to protect the weak, to protect those who are going to be harmed. All right, possibly the just war doctrine could come in here. Secondly, I've often thought, well, wait a minute, Romans 13. Now, I know Romans 13 no longer means what it, I mean, we learned quickly that the evangelical world throughout Romans 13, whenever there were rules given out about the pandemic that we didn't like, then all of a sudden the government was evil and we didn't have to, we didn't have to submit to the government. It's amazing. Christians can change any passage of scripture to face any certain circumstance that they find themselves. But I've always thought in a roundabout way, if the government has the authority and they do not bear the sword in vain, which means that they can execute punishment against the wicked. They can carry out war. So the government has some authority to use force, right? Uh, uh, carry out capital punishment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that authority was ordained by God. If that authoritative structure 
the government says, hey, we give you, the individual citizen, authority from the state to protect yourself and use self-defense, then does that does that fit in with how do how do I reconcile that? Because now I have a God ordained authority because all government is ordained by God. Now, again, Christians have kind of thrown this out because we've now said that we we can reject the God ordained authority and it's only God ordained authority if they do the right thing. If they do the wrong thing, they're no longer God ordained authority. So once you throw out the government's authority, then you could not use this argument. But if I believe that authority is ordained by God and it says, hey, we are giving you, we authorize you the right to defend yourself, then am I by carrying out self-defense in these hypothetical situations, am I being obedient to Romans 13? Which does that then trump? Does that negate what Jesus tells me to do as an individual, which is it's not an eye for an eye. It's not tooth for tooth. It is love your enemy, turn the other cheek, resist not evil, and put others before yourself. And and again, you're going to say, well, Jesus can't mean that to me because if if it means that, then we're going to, we're going to just become a, a, you know, a a, a, people just going to walk all over us. Well, the the issue is the minute you minimize it, you destroy the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. It's supposed to give you a moral standard that is beyond our capability to keep it, which means we need Christ's obedience to it. He preached it and he obeyed it. Jesus didn't defend himself. Jesus turned the other cheek. He did not resist evil. So how do we reconcile these concepts? This does not make someone an enemy within the church. This makes someone going, man, okay, we've got this tension in scripture. There is tension and it's okay to have that. To me, the enemy within the church is the one who ignores this tension and then just blast anyone who has a different perspective. This is an emotional subject. It is an emotional subject to think about someone breaking into your house and going, what is my responsibility as a Christian in this month? What am I supposed to do? On one hand, I sing praise songs that he is my rock and my refuge and my shield. Nothing can touch me. I, I, I am under the protection of the sovereign God. I can't fear anything. And I am more than a conqueror. Nothing can touch me. And, and I will not die until God dec- has decreed me to die. We say all of these big, powerful words while we're all carrying guns. I don't fear death. I The fear of death is gone, but I've got a gun on my hip in case someone breaks into the church and tries to kill me. I've got eight guns at home, but I don't fear death. And I believe God is my rock and my shield and he will protect me. But if God doesn't show up, I've got a clip of, you know, 22 rounds so that I can take someone down. And like Christians don't ever see the, like the world looks at it and, and, and looks and go, what is your guy's problem? Again, I, I've, I've told the story a thousand times, but it's so powerful to me. I can't remember which news organization. It was when churches were having a big deal about everyone own a gun, everyone have a gun because of some church shootings. I, and, and so everybody was going crazy. So they, they send a reporter to this church. The reporter sending at, standing at the back of the sanctuary. Up on the screen is some praise song. Everybody's got their hands lifted. And it's like, God is my protector, my shield. Nothing can harm me. I am protected by the power of God. These kinds of lyrics. And they all got their hands raised and, and, and rapturous praise. And then the camera, it, it captures the, the, that photograph captures the lyrics on the screen, shows everyone with a raised hand. And guess what's on almost everyone's hip, especially the men in the church? They're all carrying guns. And the reporter's like, so wait a minute, you so trust God as your protector that you're all armed to protect yourselves. So is God really your protector? You say you don't fear death, but you sure are going to make sure that the shooter dies before you. This is a t- this does not make someone an enemy within the church to ask these questions. It doesn't. And, and as soon as you say this, people get mad. Like you're a, you're a liberal and you're, and you just start calling you names. Like, no, I'm just trying to reconcile. What do I do with this? These scriptures. Some people will run to the old Testament. Well, in the old Testament, they fought war. Okay. And guess what? We're not to fight war. That power now goes to the state, to the government who now bears the sword. We, we, we are, it's not an eye for an eye and a tooth for to, a tooth for us individually. We are to turn the other cheek. 
We resist not evil and we are to love our enemy. What does it mean to love my enemy? Does it just mean that, oh, well, you know, that person who's rude to me when I see him in the supermarket, I'm just like, how are you doing? How are you, kid? And we, and we give that fake Christian garbage where in our heart we're like, oh, man, I can't stand this person. But I'm a Christian. I got to show that I love my enemy. How are you doing? How are the kid? Oh, that's so good. I'm so happy for you when inside you feel. Is, is, is it some fake garbage like that? Or does love your enemy put you in a, a very precarious situation that is that is almost well impossible for us to keep in any meaningful way, meaning that we need Christ who did love his enemies? I just, I'm just baffled that this discussion about the enemies within the church has now turned to this. Hey, if someone breaks in your house and they're going to rape your wife, you, you you make them a ham sandwich. You're just being ridiculous. You're not even trying to engage in the actual tension here. There is tension here. And there is a long history of Christians who took a more pacifistic approach. And you know why there's difference? Because you got the text. Some people are like, well, that text is pretty clear. It's just amazing within Christianity, a text that seems abundantly clear is not abundantly clear. And texts that are not seem to be clear are claimed to be clear. The enemy within the church is the enemy within all of us that when we don't like a scripture or when a scripture makes us feel uncomfortable or if a scripture goes against what we want, we just change the scripture to fit with what we want. Well, I I just love how, hey, we can do this in this situation, but that homosexual, they can't change the scripture to justify their homosexuality. How dare they? They are garbage. They're heretics. They're disgusting. And then we're over here changing scripture on all kinds of things to, to, to fit what we want. If it's good enough for you, it's good enough for everybody. But nobody wants to have these conversations. We just like, enemy of the church, enemy within the church, enemy of the church, enemy to Christianity. It is not saying to love them to the extent that we actually are showing neglect and hatred for our own loved ones. And so when you're dealing with the realities of the world, the scriptures are not telling us that Jesus was so loving and we're called to be so loving that he actually came to make the world softer on crime or that we should not realize that there is an inevitability that when the Scripture says you're to be at peace as much as possible with all that lieth within you, we should be inferring that it isn't always possible to stay at peace with everybody. Yes. And Jesus in Matthew 23 was quite fierce. We're busy sitting at the table of influence that Jesus would have been flipping over. When we love our enemies, it is not at the expense of our family and our fellow citizens. So we do have to have a rigorous defense. Yeah. And I. I mean, I, he's not even trying to deal with He's just like, oh, Jesus couldn't have meant this. He didn't mean this. He didn't mean this. And you know how we know he didn't mean this? Because some Christian on a podcast and some person standing in a pulpit said, he didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. Well, I'm, you, you're setting up a hermeneutic that allows you to just say Jesus didn't mean anything. Say love is shown in a military man who's willing to die for his country. He's not necessarily engaged in war and firing a gun or missiles or anything else because he hates the bad guys so much. But perhaps he's really being motivated by a love for home, his children, and his way of life so much. Love for home, love for your country, love for family trumps love for your enemy. How, how, how does that work biblically? I, I, I don't know. You, you. That he's willing to fight evil. So the Bible does not teach this false dichotomy. I, I love this, that, that the military man is willing to fight evil. Who's evil? Like, I, I, lo- I love this. Like, so I'm assuming whenever Americans fight a war, we're always fighting evil. We're never the evil. We're always fighting evil, right? Is, is that really the way it always works? Has every war that America has been engaged in, does it even come close to meeting the just war doctrine? I mean, we invaded a country named Iraq on the pretense that they had weapons of mass destruction. 
There was no connection to them and 9-11. They had no weapons of mass destruction. Depending on the statistics, you look like close to a million people died. And it's like, oops, sorry, we broke your country. Eh, sorry. And oh, because of all of this mess, ISIS arose. Hey, sorry, our, our bad. I mean, we tried to find them. I mean, you know, we looked around for the weapons of mass destruction. We couldn't find any. We gave false pretense for invading your country, false pretense for killing people, false pretense for destroying your infrastructure, false pretense for maintaining a military presence here. But hey, sorry, it's on us. Hey, but man, we were fighting evil. Were we fighting evil or were we the evil? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not allowed to ask that question. I'm being an enemy within the church. And don't you dare question. Don't you dare question me. In regards to my supposed love for country, I was in the United States uh, uh, military at that time. And as a result of what happened and something I had to do, well, I my military career ended up coming to an end because I was rendered well medically unable to continue because of what happened to me. And I still have the medical issues related to everything that happened to me and declared 100 percent disabled by the United States government. So don't you dare call into question me because I always get emails. You piece of garbage. You don't love your country. I wore the uniform for 19 years. Okay. So don't, don't, oh, I always have to defend myself and I hate defending myself, but it's like, I can't even speak these words. But no, when I was in that uniform and was getting prepared to go to Iraq, to an undisclosed location somewhere near Baghdad, can't, can't go into all the details, but, but guess what? I was the one going, ah, I don't think there's not weapons of mass destruction. There's no weapons of mass. There's not weapons of mass destruction. There are not weapons of mass destruction. There are not weapons of mass destruction. And my military job was to go set up a decontamination center because there are threats of them using chemical weapons. But I'm like, there are no, there, I guarantee you, there are no weapons of mass destruction here. It's not. No, I don't believe, I completely believe this is not right, real, not right. And turned out I was correct. Turned out it didn't matter. <laughs> Next thing you know, they were calling the code blue and I'm laying on the ground and having a seizure. But that's a whole different story. All right. But um, that uh, I, I, I think it's just it's just we paint this. But we're always fight. We're always the good guys. And we're fighting evil. And, and we're fighting evil doesn't mean that. And, 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 fight, and I understand war is sometimes necessary. I understand that. And I believe in the just war doctrine. But it, it, this, this, this concept is like, you know, you can still love your enemy. You can still love your enemy when you're putting 18 bullets in them. You, you're, you're, you're still loving your enemy if you shoot them three times when they come through your front door. You're still loving your enemy because Jesus didn't mean that loving your enemy was not doing those things. Well, you, you got to deal with the tension here. I have to love enemies to the point where I neglect my own family. We're to strive to be at peace as much as lieth within us understanding it isn't always possible, not even for God. Lucifer betrayed him. Lucifer took one-third of heaven, and this is a reality we have to deal with. If it was done to God, then we are going to have warfare as well. Revelation says, I beheld Michael and his angels, and they warred with the dragon. I mean, God doesn't escape war, neither can we. So we have to be militant at times, just like heaven is, and Michael is armed with a sword, and he fights. So must we in this world. And most frightening of all is Jesus has promised he will return and he will come warring against evil. That's right. That's right. We should not shirk from battle against evil. I think part of my point is National Association of Evangelicals is also a part of the Evangelical Immigration Table, which is another outfit funded totally by George Soros. I think the question I'm asking anyway is why on earth are evangelical outfits yoking with one of the most evil men on the planet, George Soros? Is the money that enticing that that's who we now yoke with? Another person you raise, Kerry Gordon, and let's play this clip and come back and talk about it because you have a problem, as do I, with Pastor Tim Keller. All right, we're going to stop right there. All right, so, so far, the, you're in, the enemies of the church are anyone who believes sexual orientation is real, anyone who believes Muslims have the right to build a mosque, 
Oh, Mar- I'm sorry. Marxism and socialism, that's an enemy within the church. Anyone who believes sexual orientation is real. Anyone who believes Muslims have a right to build mosques in the United States of America. And anyone who has a massive struggle with, I don't know, nuclear war, war, killing people, why we say we love our enemy. People who raise questions, those are enemies within the church. And now T- Timothy Keller is about to be viewed as an enemy within the church. Now, I subscribe to Timothy Keller's sermons, but I didn't know I was subscribing to sermons of someone who's an enemy within the church. I mean, I do subscribe to people who I do believe are enemies within the church, but that's a whole different thing. Based on some of the things they're saying, I'm starting to think they are the enemy within the church, but that's a little hyperbolic, all right? So let's look at here. We have, we're going to stop at the 37-minute mark. All right, 37-minute mark. We didn't make it very far, and I know this is taking forever, but they keep bringing up issues, and I know that everything I said was super controversial, and I hated that I had to defend myself, but as soon as I call into question anything about the United States military, people are like, you're not patriotic, you don't love this country, just get out, just leave, you're gar, and I'm like, you know, I, I think I earned my right to be here, I was born here, I'm a citizen here, and I wore the uniform for 19 years, right? I, I, I think I, I did, and I and the only reason my military career ended is because of what happened to me, all right? I didn't do it to myself. It happened to me, and I face the cons- and I deal with those consequences every single day with my ongoing seizure disorder and the neurological issues that I experience. So I think I have the right to, to say something. I think so, but it's just amazing if you say anything that you're a liberal who you probably never wore the uniform, and you and it's, and it's usually it's people who say that garbage who they never wore the uniform form themselves but that's 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 neither here nor there um but uh, yeah that i i think look anyone who's honest with scripture realize there's a tension love your enemy okay can i love my enemy when i put three bullets in them do am i showing that i'm fearful of death am i showing that i'm placing my i'm placing my life before their life when i'm supposed to lay down my life I'm supposed to die to self, deny self. How does that all work? How do we reconcile that? And, and in some ways, it's it's irreconcilable in some ways. But I know this. The one thing we can't do in trying to reconcile it is minimize the words of the Sermon on the Mount because that destroys the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount, which is an exposition of the law to show us that we're all condemned. All right. This is going to spark much debate. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. I'm going to go downstairs, grab some food, watch a little college football. Yes, I am. And then try to do some more work up here today. I mean, the microphone's right here. Everything is set up. So it's good to have the studio. Well, all I have to do is walk up one flight of stairs and I'm in the studio and can go live anytime. What a great time to be alive. I can press one button and be alive on the internet talking about difficult issues that we all should be struggling with because anyone who has a Bible, if you don't see the tension in scripture and embrace that tension and struggle with it, I'm sorry. It's the avoidance of the tension. It's avoidance of the difficulty. To me, that is more the enemy within the church than those of us who struggle and question and try to try to figure it out. All right, but email me, newsif at yahoo.com. We'll be back sometime today. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.